testing, testing.
There we go. I am on. Uh, good evening. Welcome to our Wednesday night services. Uh, we're a little light tonight because we got uh, Camp Enigahi going on, and uh, I understand it's a little warm out there. Uh, we want to remember all of our campers and hope they have a good time and uh, get home safely at the end of the week. Uh, our sister Diane Holbrook uh, uh, is in Piedmont, Rockdale. Uh, let's keep that family uh, in mind. We still got Gregory and Sonia Howard that's out and Val Brown. Uh, we want to keep these people in, in our uh, prayers. Bonnie Sales, uh, Stephanie's mother is still in uh, rec recovery. Uh, from hip surgery and rehab down in Tampa, Florida. Mia Stringer, uh, the brother and sister uh, Cooper's uh, son-in-law's sister uh, is now in hospice. Uh, and we want to remember the others that put on our uh, long-term health care extended prayer list, uh, Milford Segura, Amanda Dickens, Michael Morris, Skip Jackson, uh, and uh, Stephanie uh, Gunn, and Angela Jones. Our speaker tonight is Dan Winkler by video. This is from a recent lectureship is where this is taken from. Uh, we appreciate everybody being here tonight. Uh, would you join me in prayer, please? Father, we're indeed grateful for another day to live and serve Thee. We're thankful for the opportunity to assemble ourselves and hear Your Word. We pray that You will be with those that are under medical care, be with them and heal them, that they may once again return to our number. Guide us and protect us in all that we do. In Your Son's name we pray. Amen. Is there a devotional this evening? Are we going? We're going straight into the lesson. Okay. Um, six more about Jesus. More about Jesus would I know. More of His grace to others show. More of His saving fullness see. More of His love who died for me. More, more about Jesus, more, more about Jesus, more of his saving fullness see, more of his love who died for me. More about Jesus, let me learn, more of his holy will discern, Spirit of God, my teacher, be showing the things of Christ to me. More, more about Jesus, more, more about Jesus, more of his saving fullness, see, more of his love who died for me. More about Jesus on his throne, riches in glory all his own. More of his kingdom sure increase, more of his coming prince of peace. More, more about Jesus, more, more about Jesus. More of his saving fullness see, more of his love who died for me. Do we want to say the invitation song for after the lesson? Okay.
everything that you are and everything that you do. And all of it is because of that sweet lady sitting right to the left of you. Am I right? And she can say amen to that. And she does. It's a delight to be with you. This is my favorite night of the entire year. We all enjoy opportunities to preach God's Word and to go various places, but I always enjoy coming to Memphis. Be part of the Memphis School of Preaching lectures, lectures and to look in your smiling faces and to sing these songs 30 minutes before the worship service begins and to know that your lives are going to be blessed all week long by wonderful men of God opening up the Word of God, teaching us how to be better children of God to His glory. She loves me, she loves me not. She loves me, she loves me not. She loves me, she loves me not. And all together now, she loves me. How many times have you done that? Has anybody ever not done that? Now, let me ask you, you have to be very honest about this. Were you ever like me? Did you ever cheat? <laughs> I mean, you count the pedals and you know just exactly where to start so that at the end you can say, Oh, yes, of course, she loves me. Well, tonight, we're going to focus our attention on this deep emotion. And we do not have to rig the outcome, nor do we ever have to question the answer. We've been given the assignment of John 3.16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now careful examination will prove that that particular passage falls into three unique segments, each introduced by a special particle or conjunction in the grammar of the Greek language. Now, I've already lost you, didn't I? When I said grammar, you checked out, didn't you? But hang tight, because I think you will find that these thoughts can be very encouraging. Our passage begins, first of all, with a conjunction that introduces a cause, a causal particle. Gar, because God so loved the world. And it forces us to go back in thought to the previous 15 verses, where we find our Lord in dialogue with a ruler of the Jews, Nicodemus. And it's in those 15 verses that Jesus tells us of the possibility of our being able to start life all over again, be born anew, and thus be added to the kingdom that belongs to the Almighty and enjoy a wonderful relationship with God. That because in keeping with the idea of Moses lifting up a brazen serpent on a pole, God was going to see that Jesus Christ was lifted up on the cross for the salvation of mankind. And with that thought in mind, our passage begins, because... Why is it possible to be born again? Why does God want me as a member of His kingdom? Why was God willing to send Jesus to the cross and leave Him there? Because God so loved the world. Our passage begins by reminding us of God's compassion. We read of the same in 1 John chapter 4, verse 9, where we are told that the love of God was manifested in that He sent His only begotten Son into the world. But then as I continue to read our passage, we are confronted with a second conjunction. This time, a conjunction of consequence. 
A conjunction that introduces something that is possible, something that takes place because of something you just read. So to be sure, God loves us. Agapao. God wants what is best for the one that is loved. God wants what is best for you and for me. And the consequence of that is, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. In Job chapter 1, angels are described as sons of God. In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 4 through 6, I learned that in a broad sense, all of mankind are sons, daughters of God, and that He is God and Father of all. In a spiritual sense, you're sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ did put on Christ, we read in Galatians 3, 26 and 27. And so God loves us. And the consequence of God wanting what is best for us is He gave His only begotten Son. He did not sacrifice one of the angels. He did not pick out just one man of all of mankind. He did not select the greatest of all Christians in His mind. No, He gave His only only begotten Son, the only one of His kind, deity as His God. But I continue to read, and I go from the compassion of God, resulting in the crucifixion of Christ, and our passage has even a third conjunction. For... God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. And then a third conjunction would be a conjunction of concern or purpose. Watch that carefully. A conjunction of cause, a conjunction of consequence, and a conjunction of concern or purpose. For God so loved the world that he gave His only begotten Son, so that he that believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And so the third segment of our passage directs our thoughts to the salvation of man. And that's why I can read in 1 John chapter 4, verse 14, that we have beheld and bear witness that God has sent forth His Son to be Savior of the world. So here is our passage of interest, grammatically segmented into three marvelous observations of thought. More careful study will reveal that John 3.16 answers three very important questions. And it's to those questions and their answers that we wish to give the bulk of our attention tonight. Question number one. Who, to whom is our passage of interest directing our attention? And of course the passage says, for God so loved the world. We are talking about the one who is clothed in majesty and honor, according to Psalms 104, verse 1. We're talking about the one whose greatness is unsearchable, according to Psalm 145, verse 3. But for a moment, Let's just attempt to wrap our minds around the glory and the greatness of God. Consider, if you would, the creation of God as proof of His greatness and His glory. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, God created the 
Shamahim, the upper regions, and the Eret, the lower regions. The Jews would put those two words together to give the concept of, in the beginning, God created the universe. Indeed, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth His handiwork. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of His mouth. He spoke, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. We read in Psalm 33, verses 6 and 9. Now take pause for a moment. I want you to think about that. Astronomers who are in the know suggest to us that the, as they call it, recognized universe is some 46 billion light years in span. Meaning if you started with point A and go all the way to point Z, it would take you 46 billion years to traverse the recognized universe. 46 billion light years, billion. If you took $100 bills and you stacked one on top of the other until you reached $1 million, how high would your stack of $100 bills be? 43 inches, a little larger, taller than a yardstick. If you stack $100 bills on top of one another until you reach $1 billion, how high would your stack of $100 bill be? That stack would be as high as the Washington Memorial times seven. A billion. But we're talking about 46 billion, 46 billion light years. A light year, of course, is the distance that light would travel in the span of a year going at the pace of 186,000 miles a second or thereabouts. So if you clap your hands three times in that length of time, light traveling at that pace would circumference the earth seven times. That's how fast light travels. But if you could travel that fast, it would still take you 46 billion years to go from one point of the universe to the other point of the universe. But wait a minute, after that length of time, when you got to point Z, you're not there yet because this is, universe is ever expanding because it's running down. And yet this is something that God just spoke into existence. Indeed, as you study the general revelation of creation, you can see that it reveals to us the power and Godhead, the power and divinity, the power and deity of God. The creation of God sets before us His greatness and His glory. Think about the location of God. Deuteronomy chapter 4 verse 39 says, There is or God is in heaven above. He is on the earth beneath. There is none else. I read in Daniel chapter 2 verse 28, There is a God in heaven. Isaiah chapter 57 verse 15 as a result says, He is the high and lofty one. Watch it who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy, separated. And to emphasize his separated, transcendent nature from all of creation, God gives us a word picture in Isaiah 66, verse 1. Heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. Excuse me, God says, let me just kind of lay back in my lazy boy, my easy chair, the heavens. And I'm going to prop up my feet on my ottoman, the earth. The location of God in His transcendence lets us know 
of his greatness and his glory. But consider the indignation of God. In Psalm 7 verse 11 it says, He is angry with the wicked every day. He never ever takes pause for him being angry with the wicked every day. And so we read in Nahum chapter 1 verse 8, Who can stand before his indignation, indignation. Who can abide in the fierceness of his anger, anger. His fury, his fury is poured out like fire and the rocks are thrown down by him. In his indignation, in his anger, in his fury, God paints the word picture of one who takes his bowl of wrath, turns it upside down, and pours fire to consume the wicked and the ungodly. And in the meanwhile, he scoops down and picks up boulders, and he throws it to this one, and he throws it to that one. Indeed, the wrath of God is revealed. To all of the ungodly and unrighteous we read in Romans chapter 1, verse 18. And that's why you and I need to constantly, constantly be reminded. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. Hebrews 10, verse 31. Our God is a consuming fire, we read in Hebrews chapter 12. If you need proof, all you have to do is remember three words. Sodom and Gomorrah. He turned twin cities into the carnage of memory. Nadab and Abihu. He turned two brothers of Ar sons of Aaron into piles of ash. Ananias and Sapphira. A stroke? A heart attack? We don't know. But they both died. They both died the same day. And they both died because they lied to God the Holy Spirit. Punitive miracle. King Herod Great, or Antipas. King Herod Antipas. He walks about strutting in his sanguine, sanguine uh, uh, robe. The voice of a God he hears. He struts around. He loves the thought, the voice of a God. And then God smites him. Watch him in the imagination of your mind as he crumbles to the ground, takes hold of a fetal position, and dies, as the Bible says, of worms. You and I need to remember the indignation of God to consider His glory and His greatness. Oh, but on a more positive note, there's the passion of God. I love verses like Romans 15 verse 13 that describe Him as the God of hope. Or Romans 15 verse 33 where He's called the God of peace. Or 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3, where he's the Father of mercy and God of all comfort. Or my favorite, he's the God of all grace. 1 Peter 5, verse 10. And it's right there on that note that we find ourselves tonight when we turn to a passage that says, For God so loved the world. Who? To whom does our passage direct our attention? To God in all of His glory and in all of His greatness. Now before we go any farther, I want you to know how important it is to keep that in mind. Because you and I tonight as it was last night, and as it will be every night that God gives us breath to breathe, have only one purpose for our existence. Only one. And 
everything that we do is to be done in ways to accomplish that one purpose. Whatsoever. That's all encompassing. You do. Do all. There's nothing outside that periphery. To the glory of God. 1 Corinthians 10.31. That's why we're here. And so it's a joy to take pause and watch our passage began. Reminding us that we're reading about the greatness and the glory of God. Question number two. What? What? To what does our passage direct our attention? And the answer, of course, is to a very special gift. I read through the New Testament and I see how giving God is. There are all sorts of gifts that He has extended to mankind, to the obedient. Repent ye and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit whom God gives to those that obey Him. Acts 5 verse 32. Imagine that in a non-miraculous, did you hear that word? In a non-mystical, did you hear that word? In a non-miraculous, non-mystical way, you and I are blessed with the gift of having a relationship with God, the Holy Spirit. Hold up, Brother Dan. We'll just read Philippians 1 or 2 verse 1. And you'll find reference to the fellowship that we have with the Holy Spirit. That's a gift. Romans chapter 5, verse 14, references the gift of righteousness. I can be right with God. I can know that I'm okay with God. And it's not because of my spiritual prowess. It is a gift. The gift of righteousness. I read in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, that the wages of sin is death. But there is the free gift of eternal life from God which networks into Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 by grace are you saved by grace are you saved through faith as what a gift from God the Holy Spirit righteousness eternal life salvation from my past salvation in my future gifts from God but none of them Start to measure to the greatness of the gift in our passage. Because the gift in our passage tonight makes all those other gifts possible. For God so loved the world that He gave his only begotten Son. I remember what Jesus said to the woman of Samaria when he referenced the gift that he was offering that she didn't understand. And I wonder sometimes if we ever take pause to consider the gift that we have been offered with the only begotten Son. Could we take just a few minutes to try to wrap our mind around the glory and greatness of our Lord as the gift of our Father? Consider, for example, the incarnation, the becoming flesh of Jesus. Remember, 2 Corinthians chapter 8 says, Though He was rich, Yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. The Greeks had two major words for poverty or poor. One meant he who had very little but could squeak out a living. And the other meant 
He who had nothing and had to beg just to survive. It's the second of those two found in 2 Corinthians 8 verse 9. Though he was rich, the worship of an angelic host was his. And equality with Jehovah God was his. The name Jehovah, his. The essence of God, his. Though he was rich, yet for your sakes, he became as one who had to beg just to survive the day. So that you and I who have to beg just to survive spiritually can be made rich. Let's think about the greatness and the glory involved in that. In Jesus becoming flesh, of course, John 1 verse 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, the same was in the beginning with God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory, glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace, full, full of grace and truth. Jesus, the Word, became flesh. He was made or born of the seed of David according to the flesh, we read in Romans chapter 1, verse 3. A body didst thou prepare for me, referencing Jesus in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 5. And what a body, what a body. Isaiah 53 says, he had no form or comeliness. When we see him, when we saw him, when we look on him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Like a root out of dry ground, stubs coming up from the roots, from, from the, the trunk, naughty in the way, he grew up before them. But it's not what he looked like. It's what he made possible that inspires us and directs us to his heart. So there's the incarnation of Jesus. I want you to look at the callus in his hands. I want you to see him walk on water and see his mane blowing backwards in the wind a mane that is water soaked. I want you to see him struggle as he's walking up the waves, and then sliding down the waves. And I can't help but wonder, in the process, did he ever stumble and pick himself up? I want you to see the humanity of Jesus. I want you to sense the incarnation, the body, the flesh of Jesus. Because though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became the incarnate word. He became poor. There's his incarnation. But then to see the glory and the greatness of Jesus, we can't help but think about his perfection. He knew no sin. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21. He never knew sin. Hamartia, missing the mark, failure. He never, did you hear that? He never failed his God. I can't say that. Hey, you can't either. But he could. He was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin, Hebrews 4, verse 15. He was tempted in all points like as we are. Be a fly on the wall. Watch and listen. James chapter 1 verse 14 says, Each man is tempted when he's drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Temptation comes by the devil using what we want against us. He was tempted. The devil used what he wanted against him. He was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. And so I go to Matthew chapter 4 and Luke chapter 4, and I read about the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness by the devil. And I see a stone. I see a step. I see a 
show and tell moment. I see a stone. Now, Matthew, the devil turns to Jesus, who is hungry, and he says, turn these stones into bread. In Luke's account, it's turn this stone singular into bread. I like to put them together to get the mindset. Here, turn these stones into bread. Here, here you go. Start with this one. Did Jesus want to turn that stone into bread? It wouldn't have been temptation if he didn't have a desire to do just as he was told to do. But he said no. From one stone to one step, he takes them to the wing of the temple. And he says, just throw yourself off the wing of the temple. Let angels come and swoop you up. Prove to all of mankind you are who you're going to claim to be. Think of all the misery that you can forego, all the rejection that can go to the wayside. If you just step off the wing of the temple and let the angels swoop you up and prove that you are the Son of God. Just one step. Did he want to take that step? Wouldn't have been temptation if he didn't really, really, really want to do it. But he said no. Oh, and the big one. In one show and tell moment, Luke says, in a moment, might best be illustrated by taking a balloon full of, of, of air, taking a pen and pop, and a pop, in a moment. The devil shows Jesus all of the glory of the nations and the authority thereof and says, all of this I will give to you if you'll just fall down and that, oh, blow me a kiss. Just this one time. Just this one time, blow me a kiss. Just, and, and it's all yours. Did Jesus want it? Did he want it? Wouldn't have been temptation if he didn't want it. But he said no. Because he was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. Not a single time, not a single moment did he allow his thoughts to traverse over the line to where he became a failure to his God by the way he thought or the way he acted. Think of his perfection. He did no sin. Neither was Gal found in his mouth, we read in 1 Peter 2.22. And that's why Peter could reference him as the Holy and Righteous One in Acts 3.14. There's his incarnation and his perfection, but what about his rejection? When I try to wrap my mind around the glory and the greatness of Jesus, this is where it begins to get very difficult for me personally. There's his rejection. In keeping with Old Testament messianic prophecy, Jesus was despised and rejected of men. In Matthew chapter 21, verse 44, he even described himself using other Old Testament predictions as the stone which the builders rejected. And in Mark chapter 9, verse 31, Mark, Mark chapter 8, verse 31, he told his apostles that he had to go to Jerusalem where he was going to suffer and be rejected of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed, be rejected. You remember, he even told his apostles the night of the betrayal that they would all fall away because of him, rejection. And sure enough, it happened, even to the point that when we come to Mark 15, verse 34, we hear him cry with a loud voice. Eloi. Eloi. Lama sabachthani. My God, my God. Why have you egg cut the lipo? Forsaken. Egg cut the lipo. Lipo, leave. Cut the down. Egg in, in. My God, my God, why have you left me down in this forsaken me? Rejected. And in keeping with the song we sang a few minutes ago, oh, 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 sometimes I tremble, I tremble, I tremble. Because I know the answer to that 
question. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In the margin of my Bible I've written, I am the reason why. The glory and the greatness of Jesus can also be seen in something that transpired after his death, burial, resurrection, and return home where he is exalted at God's right hand. And that would be his post-resurrection ministry we reference as intercession. Hebrews chapter 2 verses 17 and 18 tell us that he is able to serve as a faithful, as a merciful and faithful high priest. High priest. A description of Jesus you will find only in the book of Hebrews and all of the Bible. And in serving as a high priest, he's serving as a merciful high priest. He can get inside the skin of mankind because he's lived as mankind. As a high priest is a merciful and faithful high priest. He's merciful to mankind. He's faithful to God the Father. And so Paul could write, There is one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus, in 1 Timothy 2, verse 5. And it's in that passage that it's, I read, Because he has suffered being tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. He is able to help those who are being tempted. Why? He suffered being tempted. And the word translated suffer there is a perfect tense verb for our Bible students that are going through Greek. It tells us something happened way back yonder and the consequences of that something remain to this day. Sitting at the right hand of God, even this very moment, Jesus can reflect on the time when he was tempted as are we, when he was tempted in all points as we, and he can still feel the pangs of having to say no to what he really, really, really wanted so that he could never, ever be a failure to his God. He's able to intercede, help us when we're tempted. He ever lives to make intercession for us, Hebrews 7, 25. His nostrils, the breath of life, and man became a nephesh, a living, breathing creature. Man became a living soul. God did that. He put a living soul inside a physical body, of which the psalmist says, I am fearfully and wonderfully made, in Psalms 139. And it's that body that we have a responsibility to use properly. Thus we are to present our bodies as living sacrifices, Romans 12, verse 1. And we are to use our bodies to bring glory to God, 1 Corinthians 6, verse 20. There's a biological component to who we are, isn't there? There is an intellectual component to our existence. As a man thinks in his heart... So is he, Proverbs 23, verse 7. We are not to think more highly of ourselves than we ought to think, but we are to think soberly, Romans 10, verses 1 to 3. God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, Ephesians 3, verse 20. And after that beautiful list of virtues, The Holy Spirit through Paul says, think on these things. There's an intellectual component to who we are. There is an emotional component to who we are. And so we read in Mark, it should say, chapter 14, love God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, with all of your strength, love. Jesus said in John chapter 14 verse 1, let not your hearts be troubled. The Holy Spirit through Paul in Colossians 3 says, put on, holy and beloved, bowels of, hearts of compassion, the English Standard Version says. In Colossians 3 verse 12, and then we are to love one another from the heart fervently, 1 Peter chapter 1, 22, the American Standard Version reading. There's an emotional component to our existence. And then, of course, there's a volitional component 
to our existence. And that's why God in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19, set destruction and life before the Jews and then challenged them, choose life. That's why Joshua would say, choose you this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord, Joshua 24, 15. That's why Jesus would say, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Matthew 16, verse 24. And of course, the benediction of Scripture, whosoever will, let him drink of the water of life freely. So here we are in this biological component. A soul, a spirit being that computes data is emotionally impressed by the data and formulates conclusions based upon the data in keeping with the emotions. Here we are as mankind. What God has made. And we have made a mess of it all. What was grand and glorious we've turned into a pile of garbage because in our self Focus in our self-centeredness. We have chosen to do what we want to do. Say no to, yes to ourselves, no to God, and sin. I'm just not that kind of a person, Brother Dan. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You're in that picture. So am I. That means we struggle and some of us yield and misuse our bodies. Even to the point the Holy Spirit would warn, your body is not for sexual immorality. Those of us that have eyes roaming where they ought not to go. Those of us who are, uh, who are engaging in conversation at work that should not be engaged. Those of us who in the privacy of our own living rooms are watching things we ought not watch need to remember that this body is not to be used for sexual immorality. It's not to be misused, but it is. We've turned it into garbage. We misuse the thought process. If any of you thinks that he stands, take heed lest he fall. That's not going to happen to me. That could never happen to me. Talk to someone with whom it has happened and see what they said about themselves before it happened. We make a mess of our feelings, our emotions, and that's why we read in 2 Peter chapter 3 of those who are lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of of God. And as a result of it all, we make decisions that result in transgression, fighting God, iniquity, filth before God, sin, a failure to God. God has created something grand and glorious, and I've turned it into a pile of garbage by myself centered focus. For God so loved the world, me, that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth on Him should not perish away from, should not be ruined away from, should not perish, but have everlasting life. The reason for that is grace. So we read in Ephesians chapter 2, beginning with verse 4, God who is rich in mercy, underline it, for his great love, underline it, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace, circle it, you are saved.
and hath raised us up together, and made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come He might show the exceeding riches of His circlet grace in His kindness, underline that, toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace, circle it, are you saved through faith that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. We've circled the word grace three times in this reading. And we've underlined the three constituent elements that make for the divine grace of God. Mercy, His feelings with man through Jesus. Love, His desiring what is best for man, the sending Jesus. Kindness, His feelings extended to man. That's a little simplistic, Brother Dan, to think that grace is just mercy, love, and kindness put together. I understand. And so I read in Titus chapter 3, verse 4, But after that the kindness, underline it, and love, underline it, of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy, underline it, He saved us by the washing of, of, of generation, a regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which He shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by His grace, circle it, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. What am I reading about? Grace. What are the constituent elements? The same three in reverse order as found in Ephesians 2. Kindness, love, mercy. Mercy, love, kindness. It is God's feeling with us it is God wanting what is best for us. It's God extending His feelings to us through Jesus Christ that makes this pile of garbage an individual who is born again, made someone new by the grace of God. That's a timeless truth. You will never reach a moment in time, no matter how culture shifts, unless you need to spend time with the greatness and glory of God. There will never come a time unless you need to spend time with the greatness and glory of the one that God sent. And there should never come a time that we fail to take pause and think of how wretched a people we have been in need of a God who so loved us. So we close with the words, He loves me he loves me not. No. No. He loves me. No matter what I have done, no matter where I have been, He sent Jesus Christ for me. He sent Jesus Christ for you. How do you feel about that? But then the moment, this wonderful brother is going to lead us in a song. There may be someone here tonight that is reflecting on his, her life. And you know beyond a shadow of a doubt the kind of person that you live or you have been, the person that you are in private. And you know deep down within yourself that you, the real you, is not the you that everybody else thinks you are because of the decisions, self-focused decisions that you've made. I hope you feel shame. I hope you're willing to walk with the burden of guilt on your shoulders to one who's willing to remove that guilt from you. I hope you'll be impressed and inspired by these simple words. Please think about yourself and what's possible. God so loved you. Paraphrase, God loved you so much 
that he gave his only begotten son. God loved you so much, he gave up Jesus. So that if you believe on him, pestuo, if you accept what God says, trust in what God says, and acts on what God says, you don't have to perish in a devil's hell. You can know the salvation of a heaven and the glory of God. Would you do some deep diving? Some honest consideration? And ask yourself, is this the Lord's gracious invitation, yours? If it is, come take my hand. Let's embrace as together we stand and sing. this evening and for the opportunity that we've had to assemble and, and hear your word. And Heavenly Father, we ask that you be with each of us and, uh, and watch over us. And Heavenly Father, we ask that you be with our young people at, and our, all of our members at our camp and have, watch over them and keep them safe. And Heavenly Father, we ask you to be with the sick and restore to their health, be in accordance with your will. Heavenly Father, we ask you to go with us now through this light and down through future walks of life. In Christ's name, amen.